Welcome to Bloomberg Law, I'm Lee Pacquia. As the 2012 presidential election season ramps up, there is now mounting evidence that new voter ID laws across the country will generate considerable controversy and protracted legal battles. In 2011, eight states passed laws requiring voters to carry identification with them to the polls. In short, Republicans favor these measures as a means to combat voter fraud, while Democrats tend to oppose them, claiming that they suppress voter turnout. These disagreements are now finding their way into courts around the country. Joining me now to discuss what this all means, we have Tova Andrea Wang, Senior Democracy Fellow at Demos, and Ben Adler, Writer at The Nation. Welcome, guys. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Tova, let's start with you. Uh, in some respects, this is not exactly a new story. Um, this debate goes all the way back to the 1960s when the Voting Rights Act came online. Uh, for those unfamiliar with this recurrent game of tug of war, could you walk us through how we got to this point? Yeah, I mean, of course, the issue of trying to suppress the vote of some people who you are considered the opposition goes back to, you know, the, the 1800s. So, you know, it goes back further than that. And then, of course, there was a new wave of it in more recent years. But the issue of voter ID, while it seems like something new because it's been in the headlines so much lately, it's actually been on the radar screen for about the last decade, um, pretty much since the 2000 Florida election, which is kind of ironic because... Um, all, of all the things that went on in the 2000 election, the issue of voter fraud at the polling place wasn't one of the ones that, that people brought up as a problem. Mm -hmm. But somehow it, it ended up uh, becoming an issue because Republicans decided to sort of wedge it into the debate. Right. But 2011 and, seems to be something of a, of a change. Why that sudden uptick? Well, actually, it was two states that had the really strict kind of ID law, which is government-issued photo identification and more states joined in 2011 in a, in a rush, which actually started in, in more like December of 2010. It was directly on the heels of Republicans taking over many state legislatures around the country and Republican governors winning their races. And um, in states that have been trying to pass voter ID laws for years, they finally had the majorities and even super majorities that they needed in order to actually get them passed. Mm. And so um, it was really with the 2010 elections that you started to see this tidal wave of activity of voter ID laws as well as other suppressive uh, laws that would uh, prevent people from uh, the ballot box. So. Um, so that's sort of what's happening. And Ben, turning to the, uh, the litigation angle of the story, you put out a couple stories for the nation, taking a look at the various lawsuits that are being filed in respective states uh, regarding uh, these voter ID laws. You put out one about a week ago uh, detailing the multiple lawsuits uh, happening right now in Wisconsin, and you put out another today talking about the situation in Texas. Uh, what, are, um, what are your thoughts on how courts are viewing these lawsuits, at least at the lower levels and in the initial stages of litigation? Well, it varies dramatically because you have, um, broadly speaking, two different sets of challenges and really subsets within those um, two different groups. So when a state passes a uh, law requiring uh, that voters present photo identification, state government issued photo identification at the voting booth, y you have the possibility of challenging it in federal court mm -hmm. as uh, a violation of, uh, as discriminatory, because these, these laws always uh, affect uh, blacks and Latinos more, or will disenfranchise more blacks and Latinos than whites. Um, and you, you could challenge that uh, under the Voting Rights Act, or you could challenge it under the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Um, and there, there, there are challenges under the law, and there are challenges under the Constitution. In addition to that, you have um, so state constitutions that guarantee every citizen a right to vote. And, and those um, state constitutional um, uh, rules uh, vary by state. And, and so you have in Wisconsin, for example, two different challenges being advanced in federal court, mm -hmm. uh, which have not yet been argued, and two different challenges uh, in state court arguing not that it's racially discriminatory, but just that it will disenfranchise people and that violates the rights of those individuals to vote under the Wisconsin state constitution. And you have a di district court judge uh, state district court judge who has issued an injunction against implementing the law. Mm -hmm. um, however, uh, you know, those, that ruling uh, could very well be reversed uh, by the appeals court or by the state Supreme Court um, where uh, you have more conservative uh, judges. So the, the, this particular debate, this election cycle, feels worse uh, than in past years. How much do you attribute that to the Department of Justice's uh, newly articulated stance uh, on uh, 
well, I guess it's a new proactive approach uh, to the voting rights issues that we're discussing here today. Uh, Attorney General Eric Holder uh, gave a very strong speech uh, last December outlining um, his department's approach to these issues. How does that fit into this discussion? Well, I think it's been extremely significant. And, and part of the significance is that um, the, the other part of the sort of legal uh, lay of the land out there is that um, both Texas and South Carolina, because they are under Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act and have to pre-clear with the Department of Justice any change they make in their election procedures, um, those two laws were opposed by the Department of Justice. And what's interesting about it is that you've got actual numbers coming from the states themselves, from the state of Texas, from the state of South Carolina, that demonstrates on its face that these ID laws discriminate against minorities. And that is the basis upon which uh, the Department of Justice is making these decisions to object. And, and so it's a little bit curious how this can be so widely second-guessed um, as it is, is being. Hmm. I wanted to ask you, Ben, about Section 5. It only applies to certain states that have demonstrated a history of discriminatory practices uh, in this area. Uh, in your opinion, is the Section 5 issue complicating the picture? Well, it's, it, it, what it does is it means that there's two different sets of rules. Uh, there are rules uh, for states that are uh, governed by uh, Section 5 or jurisdictions within states mm. that fall under Section 5, um, and then there's everyone else. And so you have, for example, uh, in Indiana, a law, Indiana is not a Section 5 state, nor is Wisconsin, mm. nor is Pennsylvania, right. which um, is going to uh, sign into law a, uh, a voter ID bill. Um, they fall under Section 2 of the uh, Voting Rights Act. You can challenge uh, laws discriminatory, discriminatory under Section 2, but it's more difficult. Um, and you generally have to wait until the discrimination has occurred. Mm -hmm. So you may not be able to, to, to get such a law uh, overturned until after the election, when, when at least once damage has been done. Uh, whereas in Section 5 states, because of their history of racial discrimination during the Jim Crow era, um, they are presumed to be discriminatory if there is a likely uh, racially dispar disparate impact. And so the Justice Department is able to deny them preclearance. So that's what they've done in South Carolina and Texas. But on the other hand, when um, you had a Republican administration mm -hmm. the in 2006 or seven, the Department of Justice um, uh, granted preclearance to a Georgia law that's basically the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's funny, you hear conservatives making this argument. They say, well, why is the Obama... Clearly, it's political of the Obama Justice Department to uh, deny preclearance when the Justice Department granted preclearance to a similar Georgia law in 2006, 2007. But really... You could just as easily say the Bush administration was being political. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you could much more easily say the Bush administration was being political because, in fact, in that case, uh, the civil servants working at the Department of Justice, who had, many of whom had been there for many years, recommended in a memo to the front office, as they say, of the Department of Justice, that they object to the Georgia law. Mm -hmm. And the political people in the front office overruled that decision, that recommendation, in, a, in an unprecedented fashion, and decided to, to let Georgia go ahead with this law. Right. right. But Tova, so, politics aside, um, the distinction between uh, Section 5 states and Section 2 states strikes me as tremendously inefficient. Is um, a, a more... Um, efficient systemic solution in the offing. There's a lot of litigation happening here. A lot of time, energy, and money uh, is being spent on basically uh, resolving a rather simple issue. What should people, when they go to their polling place, present to get in there and cast their vote? Well, I mean, I kind of disagree that it's a simple issue, but I think that there is uh, plenty of reason for section, section 5 to continue to be in place and continue to put these particular states under uh, special scrutiny. Mm -hmm. Why is it just special is, states? Why, why shouldn't it just be applied to all states and just make this an easier process that every state has to go through? Why not just expand well, it to I everyone? I mean, that, I mean a state could expand. wake up one day and be discriminatory when it wasn't in the past, right? Yeah, but if you look at the reams of testimony from the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act in 2006, you will see that it is still disproportionately these states that do impose disc discriminatory schemes in their voting processes, and that's why, in fact, the Senate uh, auth passed the reauthorization unanimously, and George Bush signed it into law for 25 more years. So he clearly believed that there was a rationale behind uh, keeping this in place. And if you had every state that was covered by it, then you would have a completely unmanageable system 
um, that would be much less likely to be held constitutional if you had you would have millions of different procedures be- being submitted to the Department of Justice that they simply, you know, as a practical matter, couldn't handle. And that would be very inefficient, considering there are many states that do not have a record uh, of discrimination the way these states do. But, but Tova, wouldn't you agree that um, we have a problem right now with the fact that states that happen to be north of the Mason-Dixon line uh, can pass discriminatory measures and we don't have a way of stopping it? Well, but we do, and we're seeing that happen right now um, with the litigation that, that's occurring at this very moment. And you see now for judges in these states, Wisconsin in particular, but Pennsylvania sure to come, looking at the data and making very strong statements. Uh, the judge in particular who permanently enjoined the law in Wisconsin uh, from going forward, talking about how really rather outrageously discriminatory um, these kinds of laws are and you know, that is another avenue. And as you put, pointed out earlier, the Department of Justice does have another tool uh, that it can use in terms of using Section t- Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. So it's not like these states are completely immune from any kind of scrutiny at all. It's just that we have a little bit more scrutiny placed upon uh, states that we know have a, a, a past, and not just a past, a very recent past in a lot of cases of discriminating. Tova, I know it's generally hard to predict these things, but do you expect the Supreme Court to weigh in on any of these cases anytime soon? I I do think it's possible. Um, As people might remember, a couple of years ago, um, the Voting Rights Act did come before the Supreme Court, and they sort of sidestepped the question of its constitutionality, but came pretty close to the line of of saying that it was no longer uh, necessary, and I can expect that that will come before them again, and we will see, um, especially in light of some of the other election-related cases that the Supreme Court has decided in recent times, whether they decide to go down that road. But it would be really quite shocking, given that just a a few years ago it was passed unanimously by by the Senate to be reauthorized for another 25 years and signed into law by by George Bush. So um, we will see. But I, I do think, yes, there's a good chance that it will go before the U.S. Supreme Court. Ben, what's your take? Well, I certainly agree with Tova that um, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, you know, Texas is arguing that it's unconstitutional. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the, the, uh, that argument is very weak. I think um, Article 1, Section 4 of the Constitution uh, and the 14th and 15th Amendments pretty clearly grant the federal government the power to uh, ensure uh, the fair and non-discriminatory administration of at least uh, elections for President, House, and Senate. Um, and uh, I, I also agree with Tova that it, that it remains necessary that the that Congress passed this law, reauthorized it in 2006, um, because there was so much evidence um, that it was still necessary. So, so I don't expect that challenge to succeed. Mm. Um, on the other hand, though, I'm a, I'm, I'm a little bit less sanguine than Tova about how we can, uh, uh, what, what, what we'll see happen outside the South, because um, the Wisconsin Supreme Court may very well, in fact, the my sources in Wisconsin say it's likely that they will not uphold uh, the district court's injunction. Um, and in any case, that varies state to state by what the state constitution protects. And I, I'm curious to get Tova's thoughts actually on, um, since, the Indi- since the Indiana law was upheld by the Supreme Court, uh, do, do you think, Tova, that uh, uh, states like Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, if they were challenged in federal court, um, the constitutional challenge in Indiana didn't work. Do you think that that uh, the Justice Department could say these are discriminatory and get them uh, thrown out under Section Two? Well, I, let's think about one one thing about the Crawford case, which is the Indiana case. The ruling there was that uh, they could not they could not succeed in, in a facial challenge to Indiana's ID law. What we're having now is people who, we have plaintiffs now who truly are unable to get the ID that, that's needed. And so this is, uh, this may go up not as a facial challenge, but um, on, on the merits. Um, and so that can make a difference. And I would also point out that Wisconsin and Texas, both of those laws um, are actually more stringent and more restrictive than the Indiana uh, photo ID law. Um, How and so? And include even more people. Well, for one example, and this actually I just found out today is true for Pennsylvania as well, they don't include um, uh, ID for students, even for students who go to state right. universities and colleges. That's for one thing. 
Um, I mean, the Indiana law basically says that any kind of government-issued photo ID will work. So an employee ID um, from a government agency would, uh, you know, technically work. Um, a variety of other kinds of, of documents could work. These two states have a very narrow list of documents that you can present um, that will be acceptable in order to vote. Totally. And actually, then, and, the, and there are, there's also an affidavit provision in the Indiana law that allows you to say, you know, because of my indigency or religious beliefs, I, I did not, I do not have ID, and 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 they can, and then it will be waived. These two states. And the other states that have passed these laws this year don't have that. Mm. Ben, final word here. What's this all going to mean for the election? Well, it's, it's you know, certainly possible that it's going to mean that there will be people who are disenfranchised in this election. And it is, uh, th- I mean, that, that's virtual certainty if these laws are in effect on Election Day. Um, whether the, the question the, that we don't know the answer to, but it's entirely possible, is that it'll affect the outcome of the election. I mean, mm-hmm. Pennsylvania is a major swing state. Barack Obama has to carry Pennsylvania to win. Mm-hmm. Um, so is Wisconsin. Wisconsin is exactly, that's right, is another one. Mm-hmm. And, um, it, 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 you know, if, if enough people are disenfranchised that it, that it sways the outcome in, in, in big, uh, crucial states like that, then, then it could determine the presidency. All right. Ben Tovo, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Thank, thank you. you. That's Ben Adler from The Nation magazine and Tova Andrea Wang, Senior Democracy Fellow at Demos. If you'd like to learn more about the cases and issues we just discussed, be sure to check out our offerings on BloombergLaw.com. You can see our videos at YouTube, and you can follow our updates on Twitter. I'm Lee Pacquia. Thanks for watching.